This program is made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Maryland Humanities Council, and the Jim and Patty Rouse Charitable Foundation. Writer-lawyer Timothy Jenkins talks with National Humanities Medalist Taylor Branch. I'm Timothy Jenkins. Welcome to The Writing Life. I'm here with the Taylor Branch, who is an author, magazine writer, co-author of a number of books, and no stranger to Howard County. Ten years ago, Howard, uh, Ta Taylor Branch came to Howard County just after the publication of his first in a trilogy of books on the life and times of Martin Luther King. That book was Parting the Waters, and it was well received by the literary community, won the Pulitzer Prize in history for that year, along with a number of other book awards. And he comes back this year with a new uh, member of the trilogy, Pillar of Fire, which has also been well received and received a number of, of literary awards. Taylor, welcome to The Writing Life. Thank you, Tim. I'm interested as to how a person with your biographical background, you did your undergraduate work at the University of North Carolina and you did your graduate work and a master's in public administration at Princeton. How did you get involved in a subject matter like this? Well, I think Basically, it was growing up in the South as a white Southerner uh, during the years when the Civil Rights Movement was growing from the Brown. The Brown decision occurred when I was seven years old, was handed down, and the sit-ins began when I was 13. And the movement uh, basically went on through my college years. And it was, it was a gathering rainstorm that most white Southerners were uh, trying to avoid. But when it broke through, uh, there were things that just finally broke down my resistance to it. Um, uh, I grew up in a dry cleaning plant. My father, uh, his employees were black. We would go to baseball games uh, together. Uh, but when we got to the Ponce de Leon ballpark in Atlanta, uh, the cleaner had to go sit in the colored section, and my father would complain about that. Uh, when, but he complained about it in a way that I knew not to ask any questions, that it was kind of a dangerous subject. And then we'd have to get together after the ballpark and meet back with Peter uh, Mitchell to take him home. Uh, so we had, white Southerners had this intimate, fearful relationship with race and segregation. And when the courage of the, it was really the courage of the students in the demonstrations in Birmingham in 1963 that just, left me awestruck. I couldn't believe that young students were facing the dogs and fire hoses in Birmingham. And I, I just, um, I had never been political. I'd been planning to be a doctor, but it just kind of changed the whole direction of my life's interest because I think it went so deep into my whole generation and changed our notions of, it turned out that everything we were interested in, even our rock and roll music had come out of the black church by and large. and and and. We sang the words and memorized them, and, um, uh, and it had a big effect on us, but we didn't know where. And so it just got me interested in it and taken possession of me. If you were fascinated by the life of uh, Martin Luther King, why don't you simply write a biography of Martin Luther King instead of all these other uh, Velcro attachments of events and personalities that make up uh, this first book of 1,000 pages and the second book of 900 pages? Well, because actually what first got me interested, as I saw, were these kids. And uh, I, I, as I educated myself, uh, trying to catch up and find out about it, I kept reading about people who, like Bob Moses of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who were at times leaders of the movement and sometimes in conflict with Dr. King. And it just seemed to me that this is a broad-based, sprawling social movement uh, in which King was kind of known as a spokesperson and at some times a leader, but at other times a follower, and that uh, the movement was bigger than King. And uh, it seemed to me also that it was quintessentially American because it, it finally took possession kind of of American history. And so 
Um, I felt that to be a biographer, you really have to follow your only that subject, heart and soul. And to me, I was more interested in the larger question of where he fit in as a central uh, figure in a, in a movement that really defined what American history meant during that era. You know, his career started in 54 and went to 68. Now, in the, in the first volume, you stick pretty close to the civil rights discussion per se uh, in the, the parting of the waters. But in Pillar of Fire, you, you seem to uh, trail off into some other areas that are unexplored territory as civil rights goes, with a deep treatment of the, the Muslim movement and the Nation of Islam and uh, Malcolm X. And why do you consider that they're relevant to a uh, discussion of uh, America in the, in the King years? You're absolutely right, Tim. The movement grew slowly. I mean, after all, uh, I think we should tell people that you're one of the people I interviewed for this book. <laughs> Uh, because you were part of the movement, part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and I welcome that. So, we, as you well know, uh, the movement grew slowly in the early years, trying to win attention and place itself uh, on the national agenda. But by the mid-60s, uh, 63 to 65, it really did kind of have the country by the throat. And it, to do that, it, it politicized everything about what equality meant and what freedom meant. And Malcolm X was a contrary view on whether freedom required integration. Uh, and he uh, established Islam uh, as a different view of equality and ecumenicism. And, and uh, once you start asking what does equal citizenship really mean, uh, it raises a lot of questions. And the women in the movement raised it. Does it apply to women? Uh, some of the women in the movement found that they were dispossessed by the movement uh, the same way blacks had been dispossessed by whites. And uh, Malcolm X was calling for equal, uh, equal rights for other religions, including Islam, uh, which was alien and foreign to most people. So when the questions of what equality really means, which is the question of all of American history, when it really becomes intense, uh, it goes all over the place, which is why in Pillar of Fire there are a lot of things happening at once. Taylor, you identified me as uh, one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and therefore one of the people that you interviewed. You would also know that uh, a number of us in uh, SNCC at that time had great resentment to the f fact that uh, Dr. King was looked at as the sole spokesman for the uh, civil rights movement. And in as much as uh, people like Bob Moses, whom you mentioned, were a cardinal part of your treatment of the whole era, why wouldn't it have also been possible to uh, do a biography of, uh, of uh, Bob Moses and give a more authentic view of the people at the worm's eye level as opposed to the, the celebrity that uh, Dr. King represented? Well, I tried to do that too. I mean, I, I hope that there is a biography of Bob Moses uh, to some degree uh, in here. I just figured that um, in my lifetime I was only going to get to do this once, and so I tried to do it do it all at once, which is why I don't call it a biography of any, any one person. I think it's, I, I try to make it a, a history of the United States during the movement years, focusing on the people in the movement with lots of, of different biographies of, of the various leaders, including Bob Moses. One of the things that you do in the book that I, I suppose some will applaud and others resent is you present Dr. King uh, warts and all. Uh, you don't present it as a, a statement of just unadulterated uh, adulation, but a balanced view that shows some of the character traits that have caused him some concern and the family some concern, hence. Uh, what has the family's reception been to the, the works that you've produced on? Uh, mixed, I would say. I, um, uh, but I don't think... For example, uh, I was just down in Selma last week uh, with, with Martin King III, uh, who went on this uh, march. He, he and I get along uh, very well. Uh, most of scholars' problems have, have to do with the King Center itself wanting to control financially and otherwise how the history is portrayed. Uh, in that sense, I and a lot of the other scholars uh, have had some conflict. But I think in the in the attempt to try to show Dr. King as a human being as sometimes uh, uh, hesitant and fearful in the movement, as flawed and doubtful and family uh, crises, not just uh, with Coretta, but uh, even his relationship with his father and his mother. Um, I think for to, to get as much fire in that furnace as he had, uh, 
you don't, it doesn't come out of a placid life. And I, I basically think that um, history is better. Marble people eventually become uh, discardable. And uh, my contention is that, uh, that the truth will make this uh, live longer. Because of the way you treated Martin and the subject matter of uh, his legacy, uh, was there any uh, problem in getting access to materials and so forth that the family might have on their particular control? There was some toing and froing over or over certain material. The, I started in 1982, the year the King Li Library and Archives opened in Atlanta, and uh, there were a lot of growth pains because there was division within the family about whether they wanted to open all this material. Quite frankly, they didn't. Nobody was sure what all was in there, and therefore what people might find. And uh, there's always been some tension over whether or not there might be some way to market it, to sell it, rather than to give it away to archivists. So. Um, uh, there were there were some um, there were some growing pains there with getting access to the information, but nothing like the trouble getting access to government information. Yes, you mentioned at a couple of points in the in Pillar of Fire that uh, you had some difficulty trying to get some access to the FBI files after some 30, 35 years, and there's still uh, uh, some reluctance to reveal that. Can can you give us some sense of what the sensitivities are? Well. To this day, there are, there are still classified the material from the early 1950s that formed the basis for the wiretaps on King and everybody else. That is the pretext or the, or the, uh, for them, which is the, an allegation that one of Dr. King's advisors, Stanley Levison, was not just a, a member of the Communist Party, but was a Kremlin agent. And the evidence for that uh, comes from 1953, which is coming up on 50 years ago. Stanley Levison's been dead 20 years, uh, and there is no Kremlin. <laughs> But the material is still classified. I think um, um, the FBI's own verbatim wiretaps on Stanley Levis and his conversations with Dr. Kings and others reveal him um, to be a great patriot. Uh, but nevertheless, they still say that we have secret evidence that he was a Soviet agent. And I think that the reason to continue that secret now is only to preserve a fig leaf of justification because every wiretap on Bayard Rustin, on, on Bob Mose, on, on all, everybody who was wiretapped during this period was based on the fact that they may know Stanley Levison. How do you account for this uh, uh, paranoia which seems to run through uh, both volumes of uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and uh, the, the whole King phenomenon? Well, I think he was a creature from a different era. I think he, you know, his formative experience was when segregation was getting uh, instilled in America after World War I, uh, when Washington was uh, formally segregated. Uh, that to him was uh, the defining uh, moment of his life. He was always suspicious of people who were different. He saw the FBI's function uh, politically as to protect average Joe white American from what he feared, whether it was uh, immigrants in the Bolshevik period or the Nazis or communists or ultimately from the civil rights revolution and essentially you can see almost uh, um, if we're in the subversion business and there's no subversion in these hordes of black people trying to change America then we're going to be out of business and uh, it ran very deeply in his bones but I think there's a larger issue also in J. Edgar Hoover which is that we as citizens allowed him to occupy a position of secret police power for 50 years and our own founding fathers and James Madison and anybody else would warn you that that kind of unaccountable power will corrupt itself over time. And we got just what we asked for in J. Edgar Hoover, and uh, it's, a, it's an issue that we still haven't really dealt with. The conflicts that uh, Dr. King had with uh, J. Edgar Hoover are pretty well known, but what is less well known are the kind of conflicts that he had with the Kennedy administration. And many in the current uh, rewrite or revisionist history have portrayed it as though Kennedy was a great crusader in the issue of civil rights. Can you shed some light on that? Uh, it was a they were riding a razor the whole time. Uh, they were very, very reluctant to get involved. They didn't know very much about the issue when they started. They had kind of a fashionable northerners, uh, it would be nice to get rid of segregation. But when it confronted with the fact that that meant that they had to go against their southern base, after all, Democrats, this is a different reality than we have now. All of politics has changed wholesale. Democrats got elected on the basis of a solid de Democratic South. And that's the only way they could get elected. And the Democratic Solid South was segregationist. And when the Kennedys were faced by the notion that they couldn't do anything with, about segregation without going against their power base, 
they got cold feet. And um, so the, the, it, it is a, re uh, a record of, of behind the scenes conflict. They're on the one hand pressured to do something right for Cold War pressures, if nothing else, to, to be seen as uh, in favor of freedom to the world. But privately and politically, what they knew was that that was political suicide, or at least that's what they thought. And we must be honest, that's not without foundation. I mean, as soon as the Democratic Party embraced integration in the Civil Rights Act of 64 that Lyndon Johnson signed, the solid Democratic South dissolved almost overnight. Uh, and it became much harder for Democrats to get elected. So they didn't just make this up, but they weren't as principled in crusading for what they said their values were as, the, as a lot of people have wanted to believe. And part of the revisionist history also attributes to Dr. King the famous phrase that we want people to be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin as a justification to oppose affirmative action. Is that really the view that uh, Dr. King expressed? No, no. Dr. King, in fact, uh, although he did um, when he defended affirmative action, he called it a bill of rights for the disadvantaged uh, and uh, tried to broaden it essentially for saying that, that um, th there were many, many wounded victims from centuries and decades of exploitation and unequal law that prevented uh, minorities and even women uh, from going to public universities, from getting jobs. Uh, we had essentially a caste system uh, of all kinds, and he proposed that it would take an enormous society-wide effort to overcome that. Uh, you mentioned women. One of the big issues of the movement, and certainly is reflected in some of your writings here, uh, was the, the position of women in the movement. Uh, people like uh, Ella Baker, whom you lift up and show as a very important figure in shaping all these things, people like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and Victoria, uh, uh, are all people that are, are uh, Victoria Gray, are all people that you mention, but they never were in the inner sanctum, were they, of the, the policy making or of King's inner circle? It was made up of basically male Baptist preachers. Now, how do you account for that for a person who is such an egalitarian and world view? Um, Male chauvinism was much more in vogue uh, during that time. Uh, but it is true that women were central to the movement, if not dominant in the movement, in all times except when it came time to have public credit and public forums. The platform was not. I mean, most shockingly, the March on Washington, uh, you know, which a lot of people remember as a great seminal event. You know, it's been overrated, but it was a seminal event nevertheless. There was not a single female speaker allowed to speak by the movement. I mean, and nobody made them do that. It wasn't like the government said you can only have female speakers. That was their own choice. And in fact, the women, the wives of the civil rights leaders, marched down Independence Avenue as opposed to Constitution. So uh, there was a lot of this is men's business within the movement and what's so interesting about it was that that occurred at the same time when the foot soldiers, the plaintiffs in the original Montgomery bus boycott suit, all women, uh, when it came time to organize a march, to do a march, to train people, to teach people to how to register to vote, the bulk of the work was done by the women. So that just reflects the culture the way it was. And that contradiction raised the issue that the women, women in the movement first began to lift up. Well, wait a minute, aren't we doing all over again on the basis of sex what white people are doing on the basis of race? Perhaps one of the biggest problems was that the civil rights movement had such close alliance with religious movements, and religious movements themselves have had such gender difficulties. <laughs> it wasn't just the issue of excluding women and the conflicts that were held on a partisan basis. There was also conflicts within the movement itself with the leadership of the various organizations. How did this get sorted out, and how did it play out, and what effects did it have in the way the movement was conducted? It had enormous effects, most of which were suppressed at the time. Um, for very good reason. I mean, if you stop and think of it, there really was a minority psychology at work. If, if you're only 10% of the population and you're trying to change the whole country, get rid of segregation, allow 5 million black people who can't vote in the South to vote, that takes an enormous shift in power. You've got 10% of the population, you have no army, <laughs> you have no newspapers, you have no TV network, and only a tiny minority of your 10% minorities involved in the movement, and they're at each other's throats over what to do. To advertise or to allow people to see the creative differences is, to, is fearful. It makes you seem um, you know, more easily discarded. 
So um, th there were many creative tensions uh, in, involved in how to accomplish what was a breathtakingly crazy goal. How do we transform America given the fact that we don't have power? Did there ever come a time when the NAACP with its Roger, uh, with its Roy, Roy Wilkins, and uh, the Urban League with the Whitney Young or uh, the SCLC with Dr. King and Abernathy and uh, CORE with uh, McKissick and uh, others, did they, did they ever come to a point of, uh, of reconciliation as a cohesive movement? No. I would say no. They, they, they came to a place where they, they, for appearances sake, on great issues like supporting the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, they put on a united front. But I don't know that there was ever a place in the movement, and this, this it would probably be seen as a controversial observation against the people who want to maintain movement solidarity. I don't know that I can think of ever a place where they formulated an agenda to take a step forward together. The NAACP never wanted to have demonstrations, uh, and to, uh, neither did the Urban League. Uh, they proposed a moratorium on demonstrations, and when they did, SNCC, uh, the students, said, you know, that's easy for you to say. You never had demonstrations in the first place. So what do you mean you're saying we're going to have a moratorium on demonstrations? You just want us to stop. So I don't know of any place where any significant initiative that involved taking a joint level of risk was, was um, jointly agreed upon. They maintained uh, uh, a, a show of alliance at the most common denominator level, like do we support integration, do we support equal rights. Now because of this heavy overlay between religious movements and the civil rights movement, you had a number of other things going on. The Catholics versus Protestants, uh, Jews versus Christians, uh, Northern versus Southern, Baptist versus other denominations. How did this, and, and black and white overlaid on, on all of this, how do you attribute the, the racial un and the religious uh, undercurrents as a factor in the outcome? Well, I think uh, one factor, this is where I think King was important. Uh, as opposed to some of the tactical things where at times, uh, say, your group, the students, were, were in the vanguard. I think King was important because he defined religion in such an ecumenical way, almost like as the underpinnings of democracy. We have equal votes because we have equal souls. That he, he, could, he used to connect the Bible and the Constitution. He would connect the Bible and the Constitution in a way to broaden the appeal, uh, and in a way that he could work with uh, Abraham Heschel and, uh, you know, uh, rabbis, and he could preach this almost the same message to sharecroppers in Mississippi that he could preach in St. Paul's Cathedral in London because he had this breadth of putting one foot in the Constitution and one in the Scriptures, so it was never religious in the sense of sectarian, uh, you know, the Baptist position or the Protestant position. It was beneath all of that, and uh, that was part of King's gift because he allowed Progressive movements in American history have always had kind of a tough time if they are anti-religious, you know, like the abolitionists. Uh, you need to get the religious people on your side, but it's, it's a great snare and a pitfall potentially because you don't want to let your, the people you're trying to reach divide along their sectarian religious lines because then you're lost. And uh, so it was one of King's gifts to be able to get the benefits of religious support without the dangers so much. Uh, Billy Holiday has a song, Strange Fruit. Uh, isn't it one of the strange fruits of uh, the civil rights movement that its activism led to an anti-war movement that led to a feminist movement that now is even leading to a right to life movement with people and demonstrators against trade and world trade? To what extent do you think that uh, uh, Dr. King would have accepted these as, as the prodigy of his legacy? I think that he would have accepted anyone that was based in love, if it really was based in love, uh, that tried to reduce our sense of estrangement and enemy you know, to, to his notion, a democratic, what united equal souls and equal votes is that you refuse to treat people as enemies, that you respect people as full human beings. And, um, and that was kind of the basis of his nonviolence. I refuse to allow you to make me think of you as an it or as a dehumanized. So I think that he would have welcomed uh, um, a, a number of the religiously based um, um, uh, movements uh, since then. Uh, on the abortion issue, which has been a terrible uh, divisive issue, and in some ways you could say that the progressive movement has been divided since you separated religious voices from the spirit of women. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, if you, if you it, a formula for progressive history in American history is to have them working side by side, like in the abolitionists and in the civil rights movement. They've been split. I think Dr. King would say that the anti uh, that the the anti-abortion movement um, trades in the language of the civil rights movement, but to the degree that what he wants to do is to put mothers and doctors and uh, fathers and, and nurses in jail, uh, it may not be based on as much um, uh, love and common humanity as it likes to think it is. One of the great contributions of your book is to introduce to the American public for the first time names like Hartman Tanbro, uh, Victoria Gray, uh, any number of otherwise obscure personalities who make up the, the mortar that held the, the bricks of the movement together. And in uh, focusing on the, the kind of centerpieces like an Abernathy's, the uh, Roy Wilkins and so forth, you've not neglected the little people who really were the backbone of the enterprise. And in that respect, I suppose that the greatest contribution that you've made is to bring up and lift in history the real uh, substance of what makes a community movement. Well, I appreciate that. And the only thing I would say is that it didn't have to be artificially forced. When you go out and do the research, those are the people who talk, that the people who are part of the various movements talk about. Hartman Turnbow, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, the people who, gosh, this woman in St. Augustine, Georgia, read on crutches, they couldn't get anybody to go to jail, and she was back cooking in the kitchen. And the whole movement is paralyzed, and this lady comes out of the kitchen and said, on crutches, she's had polio, and says, I'm ready to go to jail, but only if somebody will take me home and let me change into a new dress because I'm not going into these um, grease-stained cooking clothes, you know. And she shamed everybody. Into People don't forget things like that. And you realize, and I think it's a great, it's part of what makes it a lesson now, that citizens really count. Well, thank you very much, uh, Taylor Branch, for having this opportunity to talk with us. And we appreciate it, not just because of the, the great acclaim of a literary work, but because of your dedication and commitment for such a sustained period of your life to tell the truth and to tell it not just from the person's point of view as an argument, but also from the community's point of view and through the eyes of strangers and enemies. This is what makes the American history, the King years, such an important series for America. We Thank look you. forward to volume three. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for joining us on The Writing Life. Thank you.